Today, our host Faith and guest Todd are both joining us from Nova Scotia, and we would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Wulistigwe'ek people first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Willis the Gwiag titles and established rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. Uh, this event is being hosted by the Ted Rogers School of Management in Toronto, and Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Faith Julian. I'm from Millbrook First Nation. I am Mi'kmaq, and I am currently a student with Ted Rogers School of Management, studying my Master's of Health Administration, and I'm also a currently working as a research assistant with Indigenous Innovation uh, Research. And um, I'm so excited to be working on this project with uh, Todd Labrador and just learning more uh, cultural aspects and how you can move forward in following your traditions and in the current day and keeping traditions alive. So you know, I'd like to introduce you uh, to Todd Labrador and give him a chance to, to introduce himself. Hi everyone, I'm Todd Labrador and uh, really uh, happy to be part of this uh, video and project. And uh, so I'm right now just outside of Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, but I grew up on the Wildcat Reservation in Queens County and I'm part of the Acadia First Nation. Yeah, so I'm Really uh, happy to be able to talk to you about what I do and uh, looking forward to it. Yes, thank you so much for uh, joining us today and sharing your knowledge. It's so much appreciative. Um, first, I would um, like to start out with some questions to you know get some more insight on what you're doing and uh, what led you to becoming a canoe builder and keeping the traditions alive. Uh, for the first question, uh, Todd, can you tell us what inspired you to take on canoe building full time? Yeah, well, it's, um, I guess growing up on the Wildcat Reserve, um, you know, there was two houses, two houses on our reserve and we had uh, over a thousand acres and, um, you know, hills and there was a river and, um, and my father uh, was the one who told me all these stories. And um, as my father grew up on Wildcat, he, he grew up with my great grandfather, Joe Jeremy. And, you know, my father was very small, but he was always around great grandfather. And so whatever great grandfather did, you know, my father would see it. And, um, you know, great grandfather was a canoe builder, a basket maker, you know, axe handles and mast hoops for sailing ships. And, um, you know, he didn't have electricity. So my father told me all these stories about, uh, you know, what he experienced growing up. And, uh, and that's really how I got interested in what I do. Um, I'm uh, a licensed carpenter. And I spent three and a half years also at the Nova Scotia Teachers College. I was training to be a, a tech ed teacher. But my hobby was always uh, learning about my culture and um, traditions and, and you know, trying to learn basket making, trying to learn how to, to work with animal skins, um, making things out of wood, you know, and, and and birch bark canoes. I was very fascinated with uh, with birch bark canoes. And also in in school, there was a few of my teachers. Um, one teacher had beautiful pictures about the the chalkboard, 
and there are uh, pictures of uh, indigenous people all across Canada, uh, you know, engaged in various activities, and some of them were building canoes. So I would see that, and then in grade seven, grade seven or grade eight, uh, I had a teacher who uh, showed us a video of a uh, of someone building a birch bark canoe. And the video is called Caesar's Bark Canoe. Caesar uh, and, and built a birch bark canoe. And I, and I was probably out of 25 students, I was probably the one who really, really enjoyed that video and loved it. And I still love it today. And uh, so um, in my spare time, I would, try to do, um, try to learn things. And, and uh, so that's what I did. I uh, always, whenever I had spare time, I would try to go out and learn about nature and learn about my culture and things like that. Yeah. Wow, that's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I also uh, wanted to know, how does uh, building canoes connect you to your culture? And does that change throughout the process? Well, I think, uh, you know, building canoes, it, it, it really uh, made me research. And, um, you know, by researching, you're, you're reading, you're, you're asking questions, and in some cases, talking to elders and, and various people along the way. And because of me having to do research and, and to learn um, really connected me even more to my culture. And um, as, I, as I learned more things, um, you know, it just, it's just like opening a book. And, um, and when you open a book that's really interesting, you go deeper and deeper and deeper into that book. And uh, that's what I did in regards to my culture. You know, once I started learning, I just, was so fascinated and so eager to learn that I, I just, you know, um, went deeper and deeper into my culture and uh, and from me, you know, I, I always say uh, I'll be a student until the day I die, but in my younger years I was really a student, but now I'm getting to the point where I'm actually not only a student but I'm a teacher as well. So, so that kind of is what changed, um, um, you know, from being a student and learning, although I still learn every day, um, but now I, I find that I'm teaching. So that's sort of what the change I see uh, as, I, as I moved on in my life. I'm more of a teacher now as well. So. And passing on the traditions. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how has this impacted the way you live and see your life? It's, it's really interesting because I didn't plan in my life, I really didn't plan to become a birch bark canoe builder, and especially to do this full time, because this is, this is what I do. Um, you know, I'm a licensed carpenter, so that was what I had trained to be a carpenter. And, and I thought that would be how I make my living. And then as I got along, I, I thought, well, maybe I'll become a teacher. So I went to teacher's college and uh, learned a lot about teaching, you know, but it was still connected to woodworking and things like that. And, uh, but all those times, um, when I had spare time or my days off, I would have a hobby. And my hobby was my culture, learning about my culture and uh, learning about birch bark and things like that. And I didn't expect that my hobby would become my full-time career. And for me, canoe building now is, is full-time because I work year round. Um, I may build canoes in the summer in the fall, but throughout the winter, I'm preparing for the next summer. So uh, it's become year round 
work for me. Although I do do other things like uh, I have leftover pieces of bark. So I'll make uh, birch bark containers, moose calls, baskets, and things like that. So whatever I have with the birch bark and the roots and the wood, if I have some leftover pieces, well, then I think, well, that's something I can create something else with. And um, if you can get something that you love to do, it's never really work. It's always like, I'm eager to go and, and build more canoes. What a wonderful way to live your life. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoying what you do each yeah. day. Yeah, that's really, that's really lovely. And uh, when starting this venture, what advice would you give your, your younger self? I was always really interested in hearing elders talk. So I was always interested in, uh, in hearing the story. So, so that was important to me. And, and I think today, anytime you can be around anybody who has experiences you know, in life or, or whatever career they, they have, I think it's, uh, it's um, very important to, to listen to somebody who has experience. Um, I didn't really have a chance to sit down with canoe builders because there weren't any Mi'kmaq canoe builders, you know, around where I grew up. You know, I, I did uh, go to see a 90-year-old Anishinaabe elder in, in the Menawaki, Quebec, and I spent a few weeks with him, and that was very valuable, and, and, uh, and I treasure that. But, um, but I think, you know, uh, of course, when you're young, you don't think about, you know, I need this for my future career, uh, things like that. So, but if you can take the time to sit and listen to people who have, you know, life experiences, um, it's very valuable. Another thing too, is very valuable in my mind is to record things, to write it down or take photographs, um, things like that is very important uh, because I didn't have uh, very much information recorded from my great grandfather who was the builder. The only information I really had was from my father telling me the stories. I have five or six pictures of great grandfather when he was building baskets or building chairs, but I never have a picture of any of his canoes or of him building the canoe. So I think advice that I would give is um, when there's somebody does something maybe valuable, take the time to spend time with them or record or document, uh, very important for future generations. If I would have had a video of great grandfather or a book with all this information, it would be very valuable to me, but uh, I, I don't have that from him. So uh, I, think, I think it's very, very important to document and record. And today we can record, you know, great grandfather didn't have electricity, so he didn't have, he wouldn't have known any of these uh, technologies. So uh, but today we, uh, we have an advantage because we can, we can uh, watch someone do something over and over and over, you know, and pass it on. Wow, yes. Thank you for sharing. That's uh, really uh, great advice. And I, I feel that uh, I am so grateful for some of the times that I was able to speak with my great grandfather and um, ask him questions and get to know uh, some about like some information about his life like the he told me about the day schools and on the reserve here in Melbrook and I had never known about them so you know, you're always uh, able to sort of learn something new when you take the time to ask some questions even if you don't really know where it's going to go so yeah that's uh, and especially now where you can record you know that's a really yeah valuable aspect 
And uh, I guess uh, you sort of given some advice already for um, aspiring entrepreneurs. Uh, on another note, um, do you have any any uh, words to sort of encourage them to to make that step in moving towards uh, doing what they love or their hobby or reconnecting with culture to um, to like move towards that that venture or to you know take that initiative in uh, in business or in entrepreneurship? Yeah, well, I I always think uh, you know. If you have a hobby or if you have something that you like, you know, uh, along the way, people may try to discourage you from doing certain things because maybe, you know, growing up, if I went and said, you know, I want to become a birch bark canoe builder, you know, although my parents didn't discourage me, I think a lot of people would say, look, That'll never go anywhere. You'll never do anything in life being a birch bark canoe builder. Uh, but I did have people in my journey who uh, didn't believe that it would ever amount to anything. Um, but if you want to do something, don't don't allow anybody ever to tell you you can't do it. You know, and uh, and I and I think for people who maybe tried to discourage me, made me even more determined. Uh, because, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that also helped me to pursue what I love. But very valuable thing to do is, is to find something that you love to do. And then it's never like work. It's always like, I love to do this. This is what I do in my spare time. And, and that's what I did. You know, I love to do this. Um, a lot of times I'm by myself. So I guess you have to enjoy yourself <laughs> because uh, because you're by yourself and a lot of times you're alone and uh, you know, but um, I loved it and uh, I didn't expect other people to like it, but uh, it really didn't matter to me because I loved it. But now, um, you know, as I said, my hobby, what I love to do is now my career and um, you know, it just it just worked out that way, and it's a bit rare. But you know, even if it's if you have an idea that's that's not a normal career, sometimes you can you can pursue it, and 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 things will happen. And that's what happened to me. Is you know, I'm I'm one of a few birch bark canoe builders, but it allowed me to research my family history and um, connect a lot of the names that I, I didn't know in the past, but now I know, you know, I'm actually related to a lot of birch bark canoe builders, you know, from hundreds of years ago. And uh, I didn't know that in the beginning, but now I know I'm, you know, related to famous canoe builder, Multi Picto, uh, the canoe at the museum in Lunenburg made by Nolan Stephen Labrador, that's a relative also. Um, so, uh, you know, my great grandfather, Joe Jeremy, um, there's a lot of canoe builders in my, in my bloodline. So it helped me to learn about my own history and my own family. So. That's really beautiful. How, uh, how has canoe building evolved for you over the past 20 years? And yeah, how do you feel like that has uh, has changed with um, maybe with technology or with your your growing knowledge and understanding and teaching of it? Yeah, well, it definitely has changed. And uh, my my biggest fear in building canoes, birch bark canoes, was getting birch bark, and that was always in my mind that how this will end is. I won't be able to find birch bark. And uh, over the years, I've learned, you know, that we don't need huge trees anymore. Great grandfather had huge trees, and sometimes he would use one tree to build a canoe. But I know that I can use many, many trees and and join the bark together by sawing with spruce roots and still make a canoe. 
from great grandfather's time when they used one big tree to my time when I used many, many smaller trees, but the bark is still thick enough to use. So that's changed a bit. But another thing that I found this summer was uh, the environment is changing so much that I can find the trees and I have a lot of people helping me now because they'll call me and say, I have a tree out back or I have a thousand acres over here, come have a look and things like that. So I can find the trees. But this summer, the bark didn't want to come off the, the tree. So the environment is changing so much that we're harvesting winter bark, which you should be getting during the colder months, like September through to May. We got winter bark in July. And the winter bark that we got this July, this past July, didn't want to come off the tree. So I'm thinking, so what's going on? So what I what I believe is the environment changing and maybe it's because of global warming but i'm not a scientist and the quality of the bark although it's thick it's got so many lumps and bumps on it they tell me that the that the tree has a disease so to use a tree with a lot of bumps and lumps on the bark creates a lot more work for me because i have to carefully remove all those bumps and uh so that's that has changed you know and and that concerns me about future using birch bark in the future. Uh, another thing that has changed is great grandfather had only hand tools. He had a knife, an ax, an awl, and uh, just hand tools, a draw knife. Uh, I have a bandsaw, I have a planer, I have an electric drill. So, you know, it still takes me months to build a canoe and great grandfather could build a canoe in seven days with hand tools. That has changed. Um, some of the bark I use today, great grandfather probably wouldn't have used because he would have looked for the better quality bark. Mm. But maybe I can't find good quality bark. So I have to use what's, what I can get. And sometimes I will use bark that maybe I peeled five years ago. And great grandfather would probably use the bark that he peeled yesterday. And it's really easy to use, not, not necessarily easy, but easier to use fresh bark because it's it's pliable, it's it's fresh. I can use five year old bark or 10 year old bark, but it's a lot more work to try to make older bark do what you want it to do. But I have, uh, a heat gun, I have hot water, I have different things that I can use to make it work. So although great grandfather probably wouldn't have used that stuff, he didn't need to because he had better quality. So over the time, the, the, the quality of the material was poor or poor. I can still use it by using modern tools, modern technology, I can still use it. So it's changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. It seems as though there are some benefits that are helpful, like with the new technological tools and access. Yeah. However, the quality of um, the access to the birch bark has changed. So that's, you know, really fascinating to, to kind of understand how, you know, there may be some benefits, but also there's some loss to, you know, some of the quality of, um, of the birch bark trees. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I guess that leads to me to, um, how has the, the Mi'kmaq relations with Canada in the world developed through the years? And do you think that uh, the sharing of culture has, um, has had a, a, a hand in that or a change in that? Well, um, you know, I, I say we've, we've come a long way, you know, we, we've progressed a long way, <clears throat> but we still have a long way to go. Um, you know, we, we share a culture and uh, it helps people understand better. But in some ways, you know, uh, we still have a long way to go. And uh, things that happened in the past, you know, 
are just now surfacing. Some people always knew about the residential schools and about the children that, you know, lost their lives. You know, I grew up knowing about that because that's something we always talked about. Now the world knows because of all the, all the recent discoveries with the graves. So I think, um, you know, we've, we've made progress in a lot of ways, but in other ways, we still have a lot of work to do. I guess the main thing is the willingness to, uh, to learn and uh, to be able to understand, you know? So, you know, when I first started things, um, I had to convince organizations and, and governments that building birch bark canoes is a good thing. And it was a challenge because I had a lot of doors closed on me when I brought, brought the idea forward and uh, they would say, no, no, no. But I didn't give up. I just kept going and going. I thought somebody in this world will agree with me that what I'm doing is value. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in 2005, I went to France. They invited me to France to build a canoe. But I couldn't get invited in my own province to build a canoe. But they wanted me over in France, so I went. But as soon as I got back from France, I got called to Halifax to build a canoe. You know, it's, it's interesting how I worked in an organization who my ancestors were there for thousands of years. My family was there, my relatives were there, and I tried to build a canoe and they said no. But after years and years of pursuing and, and you know, and trying, trying, now I'm, that's what I do. But the people in the past who told me I couldn't do it, probably made me more determined to do it. So, so now I'm sharing canoe building with the, with the world and with the visitors all over the world that come to see what I do. So now I have, uh, I'm already booked for next year and I could get booked for the year after, but I don't like to book too far ahead. But uh, it's something that really very few people ever did I always thought it was a value in it. And, um, and the people who come to see me agree with me. They really, they really uh, appreciate what I do. And uh, that makes me feel good to know that, uh, you know, even though I, I went up against brick walls many, many times, now I say there's a door in that brick wall and they invite me through. So, yeah. Wow. That's, uh, that's so, so, um, you know, eye opening and just uh, being able to push through, you know, all these, uh, uh, these doors being closed. And, you know, I feel as well, like the international, you know, the people across the world, across the globe have so much to um, offer. And uh, I mean, even like the artwork in the background hanging, this is my father's work, Lauren Julian. And uh, he goes, he uh, goes by his native name, Warrior on the Hill. And uh, when he was um, starting out, you know, it was uh, also a struggle for him in the beginning. And um, but he received a lot of support from uh, in Germany and in different uh, European countries that, you know, loved his work and, you know, and being able to sell his work allowed him to be able to invest more time into pursuing his artistry. So, yeah, I think that's uh, really interesting about um, how you were invited to France and then you know, with that, you were able to then sort of have these opportunities here in your, your own country, your own land. You're yeah. like, this is our unceded territory. And it took some international consideration or appreciation for it to be recognized here in Canada. Yeah. So, you know, thank you so much for sharing that. And I feel like that's a really great, uh, 
thing to mention too for people who are here in Canada is to, um, you know, to think about representation and to think about do you have an Indigenous community close by and do you see that the Indigenous people are near your community? Do you celebrate, you know, the Indigenous community near you, beside you? And uh, because that is, uh, you know, that is a way to to show representation and to to honor the First Nations people that were here before them. So yeah, I really do appreciate appreciate that story. Mm -hmm. And uh, to finish off, our final question I have is. Um, what would you like to see in the next seven generations? Hmm. How much time do you have? Uh. <laughs> um, well, well, I, you know, I, um, one thing that for, for me um, is the struggles that I go through, and most people don't see the struggles that I go through, it's still uh, challenges that I go through every, every canoe that I build, uh, it's better now than it ever was, but it's still, for example, getting birch bark. A lot of the times we use the bark off the tree, but not necessarily do we need the tree. But the challenge is to try to get the tree before the forestry company cuts it and takes it, you know. So it's always a challenge to, you know, because I might want that birch tree, but I can't get the birch tree until the bark peels. And at the forestry industry, they don't want to wait till that tree peels. So it's a huge challenge to, okay, I see a beautiful tree, but I can't get it. So they cut it, take it and cut it up, sometimes burn it, you know, for, for fuel or whatever. So that's a challenge when I, to get the bark. Uh, another challenge that I had in the past was uh, there were prescribed burns. So they were burning five acre lots. And, um, and I knew that the lots they were burning were birch trees. So I'd go to them and say, look, if you're gonna burn that tree, can, can I use the bark to keep our culture, you know, traditions going? And for the longest time, they'd say no. So they would burn five acres here, five acres there, and I couldn't get the bark. And I thought, if they're gonna burn it, why won't they allow us to get birch bark? So that was a challenge. So, so I, I went through that many times and it was the government who was actually burning this, this, these lots. They were trying to promote the growth of a certain species of tree by removing the other species. and. Uh, so they burnt these trees and burnt these birch trees. And I said, okay, if you're gonna burn them and you're not gonna let me collect the bark on our own ancestral land, then I'm gonna go get the bark. So I did, so I sort of broke the rules. So I went back and I, and I harvested birch bark and part of it was black because the, the fire had burnt it but the other side of the tree was usable. So I harvested the bark and it was actually winter bark. And in the same time, you know, the, the authorities saying, no, you can't have that. And I thought, well, I don't agree with you. I, I should be able to use it to, re, to help revive our culture and our tradition. And I got the, the birch bark off the tree and I built an 18 foot 10 ocean going Mi'kmaq canoe and turned out to be beautiful. And that canoe now is at the Canadian Museum of History in Gatineau, Quebec on display. Wow. And for the years they told me I couldn't have that bark. I actually broke the rule and I went and got the bark because they were burning it. And now the canoe is on display in Gatineau in the museum. So for the next generations, the seven generations to come, I just hope that there's a better understanding, um, you know, our environment needs to be respected. And if industries out there are not using certain parts and other people can use it, like the birch bark, um, we need to have a better 
communication so that our, our ancestral teachings and traditions can continue here in our ancestral land. You know? So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that we need to set down and talk about to make things better for future generations. And, uh, you know, and I, and I see a lot of will out there to help us and to work with us. Uh, but I also see a lot of uh, room for improving things. So I hope for the better future where our, our people and the first people of these lands won't have so much of a struggle, you know, to, to celebrate our culture. Wow, um, thank you so much. You're welcome. Hello, Lynn. I have so much respect for you, Todd. I, I've known about you since I was a young girl and uh, I've always known of you as the, you know, the canoe builder and Mi'kma'ki and keeping the traditions alive. And, um, you know, the only canoes I've ever seen in real, like within like in front of me are the canoes that you have built so you know well Alan, thank you so much for you know pursuing your hobby and um you know in fighting the the good fight and uh you know making these opportunities for us along the way to reestablish ourselves in this territory and to um, you know, be able to continue on these traditions and also you doing the hard work of figuring it out, you know, with um, a bit of a gap there. So thank you so much for that. You know, we're, we are so indebted to you and, um, you know, you're a very honorable elder in our community and I am so excited to be able to meet with you soon and and learn a bit myself about building canoes. So thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you.